Good morning. My name is Casey Dillman. I am a postdoc in the Division of Fishes in Vertebrate Zoology, and I'm going to talk to you about some ongoing research that I've been working on for a while, um, specifically today about nuclear DNA in sturgeon and whether or not that's going to help in clearing muddied waters about the phylogeny of those fishes. For those of you that might not be familiar with sturgeon, they're a really amazing group of fishes characterized by several synapomorphies, including but not limited to four barbels in front of the mouth, five rows of scutes, two paired, one dorsal row, and an oral set of jaws without teeth in the adults. They are distributed in the northern hemisphere exclusively, 17 species in Asapenser in the top left, two species in Huso in the top right, three species of Scaphorhynchus in the bottom left there, and three species of Pseudoscaphorhynchus in the bottom right, for a total of 25 species. And you might be thinking they look like a kind of unique group of fishes, and they've looked that way for a very long time. This exquisite fossil from the Cretaceous, if you've looked at sturgeon, you can immediately tell it is a sturgeon. Um, in addition, in 2010, just a little over five years ago, the IUCN met and said that 21 of those 25 species are at risk of extinction, making sturgeon the most critically endangered group of uh, organisms possibly uh, in the world. And they face myriad threats. Um, very standard things that we think about, including pollution in the water, as well as drying up of sea basins for agricultural use. But sturgeon also face a very unique threat in that they are the source of caviar in the world, um, which is a delicacy. And in this picture here, you can see this huso that is, is quite large and doesn't fit into the entire frame. This is a, about a 4,000 pound animal, meaning that a quarter of its body weight would possibly be eggs, making it a million dollar fish. But not all fish get that big. This is a gravid female from the Aral Sea Basin, Pseudoscaphorhynchus, an adult female is about six inches long. So really quite an interesting group of fish morphologically. And, and Darwin in 1859 summed morphology up very nicely by saying it's the most interesting department of natural history and may be said to be its very soul. Um, and I think that can be summed up again with beauty, complexity, and differences between organisms which led me into some of my comparative developmental work on sturgeon where we described uh, complex by complex looking at characters for understanding phylogeny. And we've looked at it from uh, complex by complex, so we've had a lot of time to get into these things, but really to understand animals from all kinds of perspective and any organism from all kinds of perspectives is important. And if we take that statement of beauty, complexity, and differences between organisms and think about molecules, sturgeon don't disappoint here because they exist at a base level of tetraploidy, they are octoploids, and there are two individuals that are 12 or 16 ploids, um, which makes things quite difficult when you want to talk about homology because you can have four, eight, or even 12 or 16 copies of a gene that you might have to compare across species. To look at it from a morphological perspective inside the DNA, in the bottom left is a karyotype of polypterus. Uh, normal diploid fish, and then there are three different tetraploids shown there, the karyotypes of the nuclear DNA, uh, the octoploid, and then the 12 or 16 ploid. So really we're dealing with a lot of DNA that we have to get at. So we don't even know if nuclear DNA are going to work in sturgeon, uh, so we needed a case study, and the genus Scaphorhynchus is serving as that case study. It's three species in North America. Um, and this red line demarcates a boundary between the upper and lower basin pallid sturgeon, which have some life history differences um, and may indeed represent different species depending on who you talk to. And what further complicates this is that with the mitochondrial DNA, which typically demarcates species quite readily in fishes, we can't distinguish these species. So as we go looking for single nucleotide polymorphisms, we really didn't know what we were going to find. And so we wanted to start small with Scaphorhynchus. And there's no pretty way to show this, so I'll just show you some tables. Uh, the very left column in all of these is the locus we're looking at. The position that is a number will be the nucleotide position in that gene. The reference sequence is what we're comparing to to look for these single nucleotide polymorphisms. And it is the same as Scaphorhynchus platyrhynchus, which is the third column. And the first thing we see is that the upper and lower basin pallid sturgeon are quite different uh, at a few individual positions for uh, this gene. And they are also different from one another. 
As we look at a different locust, we see the same pattern showing up. We also see some differences in other species. But what we're also starting to see is we're picking up polymorphisms in these genes across the region, across this specific gene. And what to me is more interesting is that the upper basin pallid sturgeon and some of these other species, in some cases, we're actually even able to pick up three and four nucleotides at a given position. So we have tetraploidy happening. And instead of losing function in these things, all four copies of these genes are active in some cases, as was evidenced by a recent publication. And that isn't a single locus that happens at, it happens in many loci. So it, it's quite an interesting um, thing to have this really ancient group of fish with these genome duplications and all these nucleotide variations um, that we're able to pick up. So we actually found that nuclear DNA was able to show differences in Scaphorhynchus and more so, we even actually found greater than, greater differences between the upper and lower base in pallid sturgeon than we have between recognized species. So we think it's gonna be useful for sturgeon phylogeny. Um, and especially if we can get some bioinformatics tools. Uh, there are many people I'd like to thank, including NSF for funding. And I would take any questions if you have them. Hey, um, are, is there any parthenogenesis in sturgeon? The question is whether or not there's any parthenogenesis in sturgeon, and that's a, a great question, and there seems to be some, some speculation that there might be, um, but I haven't seen any of that documented in the literature. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and so, the, but they do have aloe and auto polyploids as well. It depends on the species you're talking about. So, yeah. Thank you. About sturgeons, if the ploidy levels are that high, I assume that the prospect of doing a whole genome of sturgeons is a little intimidating. And I'm wondering what plans there may be for, are you just going to shy away from that issue? <laughs> no. Uh, actually, I think that would be a fantastic thing to do. Um, the project I'm involved with right now is not doing that. We really kind of wanted to just see whether or not we could get nuclear DNA to show any differences. The first study that I was that I found that had looked at nuclear DNA, actually looked at the um, internal transcribed spacers and a ribosomal gene, which has been hypothesized to be driven by concerted evolution. So within a species, you're going to have um, the, each, within a species, it's more closely related to all the other pool of, of um, copies. But what they found was that none of the species were monophyletic and they actually got two clades, one more closely related to the out group and one of all this variation in the in-group. So there is a lot of intimidation factor for going for it, but I think it's something that we can do. Um, right now, even with this, I didn't mention it, the data were collected using a next-gen platform. So I'm still trying to figure out how to pull the alleles out so that we can actually do some phylogenomic work. And right now I'm at a point where I'm just able to get the SNPs. And it was fa quite fascinating that we were able to pick up all four copies of, of some of those genes. So. I have a question about sturgeon. They're really weird looking. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about the ecology that make them look so weird? And if they all go extinct, what's going to happen to their ecosystems? So they, they are weird looking. They're, they're quite beautiful. Um, <laughs> they, they have a very unique uh, history in the sense that they make most of their living on the bottom. And they have these protrusable mouths that are like small vacuum cleaners and they suck up all these invertebrates and all this mud and muck and they filter it out. They have this big muscular, almost like a crop kind of crushing things as it gets swallowed. Um, in terms of what will happen to their ecosystem, you know, when they go away, certainly there are active uh, propagation. So with 21 of 25 species being endangered, there is a very active aquaculture um, to have them around not only for replacing, but also for caviar. So there shouldn't be as much pressure in the wild. Um, but in terms of totally what happens in the ecosystem, that's a, a great question, and I, I don't know. Surely there would be a, a damage to function given their history. 